In this lesson of review, we'll be reviewing the ideas behind functions, specifically um, the different types of functions that we need to be familiar with for the exam, along with um, properties of functions. So basics of a function. A function f is a mathematical rule that takes in an input to produce an output. Um, the only condition that a function rule must meet in order to be a function is that the rule f must provide a unique, meaning only one, output y for an input x. Graphically, this can be interpreted via the vertical line test. If a vertical line intersects the graph of curve at two points and hence, y values, and hence multiple y values for one x value, then the curve is not a function. So if we look at y equals x squared, we can see that um, our vertical line intersect at strictly just one point on our curve for each x value, hence this is a function. Whereas if we look at the corresponding graph y squared equals x, we can see that this is not a function um, because our curve, um, because our vertical line intersects multiple y values for one x value. Slope in the equation of a line. Provided two points x1 and y1, x2 and y2, one can write an equation for the line passing through these two points by calculating the slope m and then using the point slope form. If you recall, the point slope form is y minus y0 equals m times x minus x0, where x0 and y0 are any point, x0, y0 is any point on the line. This equation you need to know for calculus, it is absolutely necessary, um, and this is the equation, the standard that the standard equation with which we will work. To convert to slope intercept form is something that we'll cover in a second. So recall that the slope m is the rate of change of y per change in x, aka rise over 1. It tells us for a certain change in x how much y changes for our line. So the slope of a line between two points is m equals delta y over delta x or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Um, you again need to know this equation as well and be familiar with the concept of what the slope represents as the slope is of fundamental importance to calculus. So some special cases, okay? Um, if we have a horizontal line of y equals a, um, the horizontal line has a slope of zero because when we have y equals a, the y value stays constant and thus never changes. So the slope is zero for horizontal lines of the form y equals a. For vertical lines, we have an infinite change in y for zero change in x, so the slope is undefined um, for vertical lines. Vertical lines also have the form x equals a, um, an undefined slope, as the x value stays constant for all y. Um, for positive slopes, are represented by uphill lines, as our y value changes, um, as our y value increases, as x also increases. While for negative slopes, we have a downhill line, because as x increases, we can see that y decreases on our graph. So slope-intercept form is of the form y equals mx plus b. Again, our standard is to write in point-slope form, and then, if necessary, convert to slope-intercept form. m is the slope, and b is the y-intercept. So if we have a um, line y equals 3x plus 2, um, the slope is 3, which means for every one change in x, there is a um, three po there's a positive 3 change in um, y. So y increases by 3 as x increases by 1. And our y-intercept is y equals 2 because this is where our graph intersects to y-axis at. Um, y axis at. at x equals um, 0, we have the y-axis, and hence this is where we get the y-intercept at. So example 1, equation of a line. Write an equation of a line through the points negative 3, 3, and 3, negative 1. So first we calculate the slope, um, m equals negative 1 minus 3, um, 3 minus negative 3 equals negative 4 over 6, which gives us a slope of negative 2 thirds. So now in point slope form, if we choose the point 3, negative 1, we're going to have y minus negative 1 equals negative 2 thirds x minus 3. So as a result, we're going to get y plus 1 equals negative 2 thirds x minus 3 for our equation of line in point slope form. In slope-intercept form, um, it's easier to convert from point-slope to slope-intercept form, and we do that by simply solving for y. So in this case, that means we're going to subtract 1 from both sides, which means our equation line is going to become y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 1. So next we look at piecewise functions. Piecewise functions, um, the idea behind piecewise function f is that for some interval, f is defined by one equation, while over other intervals, the f is defined by other equations. And it should say other equations there, not functions. So for our purposes in preparation, we are only going to focus on how to write linear piecewise functions. In order to do so, we can follow the steps below. Identify the interval for a particular function. Um, recall that the closed dots means that the function is defined at the point, while open means the function is not defined at the point. Um, so for example, at x equals 2, 
This line is defined at x equals 2, and this line is defined at x equals 2. While at x equals 4, this horizontal line is not defined, okay? At x equals 4, it's this line right here that is defined at x equals 4 because it has a closed dot there. So let's look like, see what this looks like in this example. Um, next, we write the equation of the line over that specific interval. So in terms of um, an example, let's look at this example right here. We're going to write this piecewise function from negative infinity to 4, okay? Again, over the open interval, um, we're not going to do it from negative infinity to positive infinity because this line right here is a little bit more difficult to write since it does not intersect at a second point um, on the grid. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to write. So for negative x between negative infinity and x less than or equal to 2, m is going to equal 3 minus 0 divided by 2 minus negative 1. Um, we can use any two points. Specifically, in this case, I am using um, x equals 2 and 3. Um, right here, and then x equals 0, negative 1 um, to give us a slope of 1. So as a result, using the point slope form, we get y minus 3 equals 1 times x minus 2. Again, using the initial point 2 and 3 right here, and solving in the slope-intercept form gives us y equals x plus 1. Now for x greater than or equal to 2, or less than 4, we're going to get y equals 3, just a horizontal line at y equals 3. So we write that f of x equals, in terms of brackets, x plus 1 for x less than or greater, um, excuse me, x less than or equal to 2. We do not need to include the negative infinity part, that's captured right here. And we have f of x equals 3 for x greater than or equal to 2 or less than 4. Thus the basic idea behind writing a piecewise function. So parent functions, each of these parent functions you need to be familiar with. You do not have to sketch them dot by dot like you're required to do in Algebra 2, but you do need to know the general shape of each function. So we have the linear function, f of x equals x is equation of a line. We have the absolute value function, um, looks, like a, um, looks like the corner of a square, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. For me, the only thing that comes to mind when I see this is I go, oh, that's the absolute value function. And for you, it should be the same thing. So f of x equals absolute value of x f of x equals 1 over x gives us a reciprocal function. We can see that's undefined at x equals 0 because if we put an x equals 0 to this function, we're going to get an undefined number. The quadratic function looks like a parabola, f of x equals x squared. The cubic function, f of x equals x cubed, is going to kind of look like the quadratic function, but it's going to invert for x less than 0. The idea being is that when we have x less than 0, we have negative x values, and if you raise any negative value to an odd power, you're going to get a negative output. And then lastly, the square root function, square root of x. So please make sure you're familiar with each of these functions. So key transformations of functions. So in addition, you must be familiar with basic transformations of function, f, minus dilations. Okay, dilations we do not have to worry about, which, woohoo, that is awesome for us. So f of x plus or minus c is a horizontal shift to the left for plus c or minus, um, or to the right for minus c by c units. So what it does is it takes x and takes a point x, y, and it shifts it um, x minus c, which corresponds to the left. Um, we subtract c away. Again, that's when we have plus. So it's a little bit weird. you got to remember that the plus c goes with a shift to the left, and minus c goes with a shift to the right. Um, or for a rightward shift, we're going to have x plus c as we get shifted over to the right by c units. And then the y point remains the same. So again, please be careful. Horizontal shifts x plus c gives you a leftward shift by c, um, x minus c gives you a rightward shift by minus c. Um, a vertical shift, f of x plus or minus a is a vertical shift plus um, upwards or um, downwards minus by a units. So if we have a point x, y, x remains the same, but we're going to have x plus or minus a and that should be, or excuse me, we're going to have y plus or minus a and there should be a plus or minus there. So there's no weird things that you have to remember with plus with vertical shifts. The plus a corresponds to a vertical shift upwards. Minus a corresponds to a vertical shift downwards. The only one you have to remember is the weird one is with the horizontal shifts. Um, lastly, we look at reflections. So we have f of negative x. That's a reflection across the x-axis um, because we're changing from x to negative x. So we're going to have x, y gets converted to negative x, y. Whereas negative f of x is a reflection across the x-axis. The idea being is that f of x is our y value, um, so we're taking y and converting it to negative y. So we go from x, y to x, negative y. So when it comes to graphing transformations, um, you, won't be able to, you won't be expected to do them dot by dot. You should just be expected to be able to sketch general functions. So when it comes to um, transformations, I prefer to follow this hierarchy here, working from horizontal shift to vertical, and then down to reflections across the y-axis or x-axis. 
So let's see what this looks like in practice. Um, let's say this is a function f right here, okay, um, that we have, and we're interested in sketching the following transformations. f of negative x minus 2 minus 1. So if we start first by looking at horizontal shift, we can see we have a x minus 2, which indicates a horizontal shift of 2 to the right. Next, we can see that outside of our function, we have a minus 1, which indicates a vertical shift of 1 downwards. And lastly, this minus right here is inside of our function argument, so that indicates that it's going to be a reflection across the x, across the y-axis. So what we can start by doing is graphing the new origin of our graph using the horizontal shift and the vertical shift. So our new origin is going to be 2, negative 1, shift of 2 to the right, and 1 down, okay? And now what we're going to do is we're going to reflect this graph across the y-axis. So instead of having this hill right here, we're now going to have a valley to the left of our origin point. And instead of having a valley to the um, right of our origin point, we are now going to have a hill to the right of our origin point, a reflection across um, the x-axis. This should say y -axis, This should say x-axis right here, not y-axis, because I am dumb. All right, actually, maybe I do have that off. Mm. Actually, in either case, yeah, no, I have this correct. Excuse me. This will be a reflection across the y-axis um, because the negative is inside the argument. So in this case, what this means is that we're going to take this hill and we're going to flip it across the y-axis and we're going to take this valley and flip it across the y-axis. And thus, that's going to give us the valley left of um, our origin and the hill right of our origin. So we can actually see the reflection in this case actually yields the same result whether it's across the y-axis or x-axis. A weird little um, fact that we'll look at in a second. So another graph of trans another example here, just because graphing transformations can be a little bit tricky. Let's say we have um, negative square root of x plus 3 plus 2. So the first thing we can look at is we have a horizontal shift of 3 left. Okay, again we start with the horizontal shifts, then we move on to the vertical shifts. So outside of our function we have a plus 2 tacked on, which means we have, we're adding um, 2 upwards to whatever y value we have. And lastly we can see the negative is outside of our function, outside of our parent function, so we're going to have a reflection across the x-axis. So if this is our original square root function right here, this is what our um, transformation is going to look like. We're going to be negative 3, we're going to be 3 to the left, and then 2 upwards, and then we're going to have a reflection across the x-axis, thus giving us our transformation. So the absolute value can be written as a piecewise function. Um, if you look at the graph of a absolute value function, okay, it is, a, it is two lines that are defined to the left, um, with one line defined to the left of the origin, and one, another line defines the right of the origin. So the absolute value function x minus c itself is actually defined as a piecewise function centered at its origin x equals c. So for x minus c, um, we're going to define, for x less than c, we're going to define it as negative x minus c, corresponding to this negative slope right here. The idea being is for x, minus, x less than c, x minus c is negative, so by multiplying, by attaching another negative, we're going to multiply two negatives together and thus give positive values. Again, recall the absolute value always absolute value function always gives positive values. While for x greater than or equal to c, we're going to have just the normal equation of the line x minus c. Um, so as a result, for example, for x plus f of x equals x plus 4, this is going to correspond to a shift of our origin of 4 to the left. While x minus 3 is going to correspond to a shift of 3 to the right. This brings us to even and odd functions. A function f that is symmetric across the y-axis like we see right here will have the property that performing the transformation f of negative x will leave the curve of the function unchanged. Such a function is known as an even function. So if we look right here, if we have x and negative x, we see that we're going to get the same y values, f of negative x and f of x. On the other hand, if a function f is anti-symmetric across the y-axis, meaning that um, for x less than 0, our graph becomes flipped, okay? Um, when performing a transformation f of negative x, we call such a function an odd function. So the idea is it's anti-symmetric, the graph becomes flipped across the x-axis for x less than 0. Okay, So we say it's anti-symmetric across the y-axis because when we cross the y-axis, our graph becomes flipped across the x-axis. Um, that's a little bit verbose, but in more layman's terms, we can see that the graph gets flipped right here a little bit. Um, so we can see that for x and negative x, we can see that um, we can see that we're going to have a value of f of x, and for negative x, we're going to have f of negative x um, is going to be equal to is going to be equal but opposite to f of x. 
So conditions that we have is that if an even function, if a function's even, f of negative x will equal f of x. Whereas if it's an odd function, because our graph becomes flipped when we plug in negative x, we get that f of negative x equals negative f of x. So these are the conditions for even and odd functions. If neither condition is met, then a function is neither even nor odd. So let's look at an example. Is the function f of x equals x squared plus square root of x cubed minus 1 odd, even, or neither? So what we're going to do here first is we make the transformation f of negative x, which means we swap out x for negative x. So instead of having x squared, we have negative x in parentheses squared. Instead of having x cubed, we have negative x in parentheses cubed. So as a result, negative x squared is going to be just x squared. Any negative raised to an even power becomes positive. And then negative x cubed is going to become just negative x cubed because any um, negative raised to an odd power becomes stays negative. So as a result, we're going to get x squared plus, if we factor out this negative sign right here, negative x squared minus 1. Note that we can't factor a negative sign outside the square root, so it stays inside the square root, but factored outside of the um, x cubed minus 1. This is a typo right here. This should be an x cubed. Okay? So now what we do um, is we compare f of negative x to f of x. We see that we do not get the same result because of this difference going on inside the square root. So as a result, our function is not even. But it could still possibly be odd. So now what we do is we take f of x and multiply it by negative x to see, or see, multiply it by negative 1 to see the result that we get. So as a result, we're going to have negative times x squared plus square root x cubed minus 1. Thus, we get negative x squared minus um, the square root of x cubed minus 1. So now we compare this f, um, negative f of x to f of negative x to see if we have an odd function. And because of this negative x squared outside, we can see that no, it's not in fact an odd function either. So we can see that f of negative x does not equal f of x, nor does f of negative x equal negative f of x. So f is neither even nor odd. And lastly, we look at inverse functions, which do pop up um, in a very small part of this course. So um, the idea behind an inverse function is whereas a function f maps from a domain, x equals a, um, to a range, y equals b, the inverse maps from the range of f to the domain of f. So as a result, we have what I call a coordinate inversion. If a function f is defined by, at a point by the coordinate x, y equals a, b, then the inverse is defined by the coordinate x, y equals b, a. The idea being is that the domain, aka the x value of our inverse function, is equal to the range of our um, original function. So b is going to be the x-coordinate for our inverse function, whereas a is going to be the y-coordinate um, for our inverse function. So please keep this in mind. This is a very important um, note that you have to take into account with inverse functions, as we'll see when we get to inverse functions in this class. So as I stated, the domain of the inverse function is the range of f, while the range of the inverse function is domain of f. Please note that the um, notation for the inverse function, f to negative 1, is read as f inverse. It does not mean that um, the inverse function is equal to 1 over, or equal to the reciprocal of your original function, f. So determining and verifying inverses. So to determine the inverse um, of a function, f of x equals y, we, again, recognize that we invert the coordinates, so we're going to exchange x and y coordinates and solve the equation f of y equals x for y. To verify your result, it should be noted that, f of, that if fx equals y is the range of a function, then the inverse should map this range to domain of f, meaning that if we, take, um, if we, take, if we um, put f of x inside of our inverse, um, our inverse is going to take us from this range f of x back to our domain, so applying the inverse to original function should give you x and vice versa. Applying the original function to your inverse should give you x. So the conditions for inverse is that the inverse of the function f should equal um, the uh, function f of the inverse equals x. Ooh, that's a very lot. That is a lot to say right there. Both of these conditions must be met. If one or the other is not met, then the result is not the inverse function of f. So let's look, like, look at what this looks like in practice. So determine and verify the inverse of the function f of x equals 6 over x minus 4. So again, we perform a coordinate inversion where we swap y and x coordinates. So we go from y equals 6 over x minus 4 to x equals 6 over y minus 4. So we solve for y now. We multiply both sides by y minus 4 to get y minus 4 times x equals 6. And thus we get y minus 4 equals 6 over x or y equals 6 over x plus 4. Giving us our inverse is 6 over x plus 4. 
To check our result, we can perform compositions of functions. So we have f of our inverse, meaning that, meaning that um, wherever we have x in our original function, we're now going to plug in our inverse. So that means we're going to have 6 over um, 6 over x plus 4 minus 4. The minus 4 and plus 4 cancel out, which leaves us with 6 over 6 over x, which gives you just x. Next, we compose um, the inverse with the function f of x, which means that wherever we have um, x in our inverse function, we're going to replace that with f of x. So for 6 over x plus 4, we're going to replace that x with 6 over f of x plus 4. So we're going to have 6 over 6 over x minus 4 plus 4. Um, we keep change flips with this, with this fraction right here, which means the 6's are going to cancel out, and we're going to end up with x minus 4 in the numerator, and thus the 4's are going to cancel out and leave us with x, verifying that in fact these two functions are inverses. And these are the main concepts we need to know for functions in this class.